This episode of Ben Franklin's World is brought to you by Cornell University Press. If you've been listening to Ben Franklin's World for a while, then you know that neither colonial North America nor the early United States developed apart from the rest of the world. And one of the many episodes we've explored this idea in was episode 47, with guest historian Emily Conroy Krutz, who's an assistant professor of history at Michigan State University and the author of Christian Imperialism, Converting the World in the Early American Republic. Between 1810 and 1847, many Americans saw their role in the world as that of religious and cultural messengers. They truly believed in this idea of Christian imperialism, which was an understanding of international relations that asserted that Christian nations, like the United States and Great Britain, had a duty to use their colonial and commercial power to spread Christianity to non-Christian nations. This is why when many Americans look west to expand the United States, Other Americans looked east and across the seas to Africa, Asia, and lands in the Pacific. Like their Western-facing brethren, these eastward-looking Americans sought to expand the reach of the United States and to remake the world so that it fit within their Christian American image. Take a listen to episode 47 to discover more about Christian imperialism and the ways that some early Americans attempted to take part in the broader world. And if you like what you hear, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Cornell because that link will take you to a special sales page where you can purchase a copy of Christian Imperialism from Cornell University Press, along with several other great titles, at a 30% discount. Again, that's benfranklinsworld.com slash Cornell. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Kovar. Happy New Year and welcome to episode 115 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. I cannot believe it's 2017 already. Seriously, where does the time go? I hope you enjoyed the festivities of the holiday season and that you got to visit with lots of family and friends. I know Tim and I had a wonderful time. For Christmas, we drove up to New Hampshire where we visited with my parents, my brother, and our little niece and nephew. And our little niece and nephew were at that age where Christmas just seems to be so magical. Like everything about it is magical. So Tim and I had a really fun day just watching them take in and enjoy the day. But here we are. The holidays are over and we have a new year to achieve new goals and explore lots of early American history together. So why don't we get started? Texas. Texas is the largest state in the continental United States, and like many other states in the South and West, it has an early American history that begins with Native American settlement and is followed by Spanish colonization. In fact, Texas has a really intriguing early American history. So today, Andrew Torgett, an assistant professor of history at the University of North Texas, is going to lead us through the early history of Texas with details from his book, Seeds of Empire, Cotton, Slavery, and the Transformation of the Texas Borderlands, 1800 to 1850. During our exploration, Andrew reveals what the Texas Borderlands were and what early life and settlement in them was like, details about Moses Austin and his plan to settle Texas with Anglo-American farmers, and the stories of the Texas Revolution and the Independent Republic of Texas. But first, I need to host a book giveaway this month. I have two tall stacks of history books that I either have copies of or the publisher sent extra copies of or that came as preview copies for this podcast that I simply can't use or keep. And this is great news for you because it means I have to give them away. All you need to do to participate in a book giveaway is to join the Ben Franklin's World community on Facebook. It's our free listener community and it's the best place I found to coordinate these times where I need to give away books. To join the community, click the link in your free Ben Franklin's World app or visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the orange Join Now button on the homepage. Are you ready to venture west into the early American origins of the great state of Texas? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an assistant professor of history at the University of North Texas. He's interested in the history of the American South and the South's expansion into the West. And today, he leads us on an exploration of Southern expansion into the West with details from his book, Seeds of Empire, Cotton, Slavery, and the Transformation of the Texas Borderlands, 1800 to 1850. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Andrew Torgett. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. 
Now, in Seeds of Empire, you investigate the settlement of the Texas borderlands and the role that the Cotton Revolution in North America played in both its settlement and development. And I wonder, would you tell us what you mean by the Texas borderlands? Sure. I mean the areas between the United States and northern New Spain and then later northern Mexico that are not really controlled fully by any one particular group. So when I mean borderlands, what I really mean are these territories that have overlapping influences. Some of it's political, a lot of it's economic, and you have these different groups competing for space and influence in a particular region. So in Texas, you have the influence of the Spanish, then later Mexico. You have the powerful influence and usually dominating influence for a lot of the period of my book of the different independent Indian groups in the territory, like the Comanches or the Apaches. And then you have the influence of the Americans as the United States expands west. And you have also the influence of different European powers, all of whom are trying to compete with each other for influence on this particular stretch of territory, right nestled between Mexico and the United States. The Texas borderlands sound like they were a complicated and diverse place. Would you tell us more about their early settlement and what life was like for those who settled in the Texas borderlands? Well, around 1800, when the book begins, what it really is is sort of the northern outpost of the Spanish Empire in North America. And so the Spanish had arrived in the 1500s looking for gold and silver and really another Aztec or Incan empire that they could conquer. They didn't find any of that in Texas. And so they only set up long-term settlements in the region because the French had expanded its influence in North America. And there had been a French explorer named Robert LaSalle who had shown up in Texas in the 1680s. And so the Spanish decided to set up long-term settlements in the region, mostly to keep other European powers out of the territory. And as a result, keep them farther away from the Spanish silver mines that were in central Mexico. But the Spanish found they had a really hard time setting up long-term settlements in the region because the territory was really and almost exclusively controlled by the various independent Indian groups in the territory, the most powerful of which during the 1700s and early 1800s were the Comanches, who controlled the Plains regions and were the biggest and most influential military force in the territory. So by the time you get to the early 1800s, the Spanish have officially been in Texas for more than a century, but they don't control anything. They have three small settlements in Texas, the biggest of which was San Antonio. But even San Antonio was just hanging on by its fingernails around this time because the groups like the Comanches, who did control the territory, really spent a lot of time raiding Spanish settlements in the region and using the Spanish as a easy opportunity to get goods or horses and other things that they wanted from the territory. And so really throughout this entire period, the Spanish are barely hanging on. The area is controlled almost exclusively by the Indians that live in the territory. At the time that the Louisiana Purchase makes the United States, the new neighbor of Texas and northern New Spain. It sounds like the Spanish really didn't have the resources to govern or even protect its settlers in the Texas borderlands. It kind of actually sounds like a lawless place. I would say the Spanish didn't really care about the Texas borderlands or developing the region. The Spanish Empire could have put resources into the territory. They could have put soldiers up into this territory, but they didn't want to invest the money that that would take because their only real objective in the territory was to keep other European powers out of the region and keep Texas kind of as a buffer zone to make sure nobody got too close to Spanish silver mines. So they never really controlled anything there. So it was lawless in the sense from the Spanish perspective that they really couldn't control much of anything. From the perspective of various Indians in the territory, it was Comancheria or it was Apacheria or it was Caddo Territory, all these different Indian groups who lived in the territory. And they wouldn't have called it lawless. They would have described this as, you know, certain areas that they control and they would raid the Spanish whenever it suited their purposes. Now, Moses Austin, who is from Missouri, seems like a man with a plan. I mean, he viewed Texas as kind of like a lawless place and also as a land of opportunity. Andrew, would you tell us about Moses Austin, the cotton revolution that brought him to Texas and why he thought Anglo-American settlements would solve Texas's perceived problems? Moses Austin, he was originally from Connecticut. He'd moved to Virginia where he started making money in lead mining. And then he moved out to Missouri when the territory was controlled by the Spanish as a sort of one of those people that tends to go west looking to be one of the first people into a territory and the economic opportunities that that provides. And so during the 18 teens, he made a lot of money for himself in Missouri as a lead miner and doing very well. What he observed in the United States 
during that time is that during the 18 teens, there's this massive expansion of cotton farming in the Mississippi River Valley. Following the end of the War of 1812, British industrialists and textile manufacturers start transitioning heavily from making textiles out of wool into making them out of cotton, which was a really exciting thing for the textile industry in England because cotton was lighter than wool. It was more durable. You could print things on it. And so you could dye it all kinds of wonderful colors. And that meant you had a very big and expanding market in Europe for all these cotton goods and all these cotton cloths. And you could sell a ton of it. You just needed a lot of raw cotton to feed all of your machines machines in order to make it. And so following the end of the War of 1812, the British go back to buying cotton from American farmers and the price just starts going up and up and up. In 1815 alone, it doubled from 15 cents a pound to 30 cents a pound. And so there was this massive rush of farmers down into the Mississippi River Valley, the places that became Mississippi and Alabama and parts of Louisiana, to grow cotton and to supply all of this to the British Empire. And you could make a ton of money doing it. And so Moses Austin had seen all that expansion going on in the Deep South. And at the same time that's happening, across the Sabine River in Texas, the Spanish situation goes from bad to even worse because there's a lot of violence in Texas as a part of the Mexican War for Independence in the 18 teens. The Comanches and the other Indians that controlled most of the territory start raiding Spanish settlements in harsher and bigger numbers than ever before, mostly to steal horses to sell to cotton farmers who are moving into the Mississippi River Valley. And so Moses Austin from his perch up in Missouri could look down and see there's this two different and completely opposite experiences. In places like Mississippi, times are good. Economics are going wonderfully. Development is expanding. Prosperity is pretty much everywhere. For the Spanish in Texas, at that exact same moment, things are getting worse and worse and worse to the point that by 1820, the Spanish are basically about to abandon Texas and turn it over to the Comanches. And we know this because the governor of Texas at the time, a guy named Antonio Martinez, writes letters to the viceroy saying, we're collapsing here. It's pretty much all over. And so Moses Austin sees all of this. And then his moment comes during the panic of 1819 when the economy collapses in the United States. Everything shuts down, the banks fail, the economy collapses, and suddenly nobody has any money, nobody can buy any land for cotton farms. And you have all of these farmers who are going bankrupt and losing their land in the Mississippi River Valley who have nowhere to go. The British are still buying cotton, there's still a wonderful market there, but you have all these people who can't build farms anymore. Moses himself had been devastated by the Panic of 1819, his finances had been destroyed. And so he comes up with a zany scheme. His idea is to go to Texas and tell the Spanish listen, you need people here who are not Comanches. I can bring those people from the United States. They're going to be Southern farmers. They're going to want to grow cotton. They'll want to come because they can get land in Texas that they can't get in Mississippi. And so that'll be the trade we can make. If you approve this, I'll bring in these farmers. They'll help settle the region. That'll give you people and stability that you just don't have now. And these farmers will get land, hopefully lots of it, in quantities they couldn't get in the United States, and they can go on growing cotton for the British. And so for Moses, this was like this perfect scheme for both the Americans and the Spanish. And the process would make him pretty wealthy because he could get premium land in this whole deal, which he could later turn around and, you know, like today you would flip a house. That's kind of what he was planning to do with these lands that he was going to get. He was going to turn around and sell them at high prices to future migrants. So Moses Austin has his plan, which he thinks is an incredibly good idea. But what did the Spanish Native Americans and Americans think of Austin's plan to bring Anglo-American farmers to Texas? <laughs> Well, that's interesting because when Moses, he rides to San Antonio, it's a 300 mile ride from Louisiana, and he's just full of excitement. He thinks this is going to be beautiful. He rides into San Antonio and he marches up to the governor's office and the governor of Texas, Antonio Martinez, tells him to leave. (laughs) He says, please get out of here. Because at this moment, the Spanish are kind of in siege mentality in San Antonio. They're terrified of the Comanches. There's been a few American incursions into Texas by some vagabond groups that have been coming in. And so any American who shows up is immediately suspect. And so Moses Austin, actually, as soon as he arrives, is told to leave. As he's turning around to head out, he happens to run into a fellow he knows who lives in San Antonio, who he had met at some point in New Orleans a few years back. And this fellow who went by the name Baron de Bastrop, the Baron says, oh, I can talk to the governor. And so he goes and intercedes and basically vouches for Moses Austin. And that gets Moses a second chance. 
And so Moses goes in and he, he makes his proposal and the Spanish governor, Antonio Martinez, he listens to all of this and he mulls on it and he takes it to the Spaniards who lived in Texas, whom we call Tejanos. And he says, what do you guys think? And they all basically agree that this is the least bad option available to us. <laughs> they don't think it's a great idea. Like they would much rather have other Spaniards come up from central Mexico or some other territory within New Spain to settle the region. But by this point, they concluded that A, they need people and it almost doesn't matter where they're from as long as they're not Comanches. B, they think it's not a bad idea because they can see what the cotton economy has done for Louisiana for Mississippi, for Alabama. They're very close to the Mississippi River Valley. We think of San Antonio, you know, we usually don't think of it in terms of its proximity to Mississippi, but from San Antonio, if you were Tejano and you were making, you know, a living, you were probably traveling to New Orleans to get trade goods that you would then bring back into Texas and sell across northern New Spain. So they had seen firsthand all the tremendous wealth and development that cotton had brought to the Deep South, and they wanted that for Texas. And they wanted that for themselves. And so between those two factors, they felt that this was probably not the first choice they would make to invite in the Americans, but it may be their only option available because really the only other thing on the table at that point for them was to abandon the region and turn it over to the Comanches. So as far as they're concerned, they might as well take a long shot here and bring in these Americans and turn them ultimately into Anglo-Mexicans. What did Americans think of Austin's plan? I mean, they're looking at Texas, right? And they're saying, OK, this place has a lot of land, but it also has a lot of Indian raids and what they perceive to be as an unstable government. Rosa would like to know what brought Americans to Texas. And she wonders if it's true that many Americans moved to Texas to avoid paying debts that they had accrued during the economic panics of 1819 and 1837. Yeah. So the Americans who come into Austin's colony are usually coming during the early years in particular because of financial distress in the United States or lack of financial opportunity. So the Panic of 1819, you know, it destroyed a lot of people's savings. It made a lot of people lose their lands and farms and things like that. And so a lot of people who are coming are not necessarily coming to escape paying debt by itself, but they're coming because they need some way of rebuilding their family's finances. And this is that particular opportunity for them. So if you're a farmer, for example, at this time, and you've lost your land and you can't buy it because you have to put up at least $100 in cash to the U.S. government, if you're going to buy land in Alabama, for example, if you go to Texas and you go to Austin's colony, they'll give you seven square miles of land just for showing up, which is a powerful incentive. It's way more land than you could ever hope to get in Mississippi. And the reason that matters is if you have limited finances, you have to leverage your capital really carefully. And if you can get land virtually free, then you can leverage what little capital you might have into farming equipment, or if you're lucky, an enslaved person who could make it possible for you to grow even more cotton and do it on a scale that might actually make you wealthy. Things you're probably not going to be able to do in Mississippi or Alabama at this time. But there's a trade-off. If you go to this territory, you have to deal with the fact that the Comanches are one of the most powerful groups in the region. There's a lot more instability when it comes to that because the Spanish have never had a powerful government government in the region that could enforce whatever laws or requirements it had in the territory. So you're giving up some of the protections that the United States government and the state governments in the Deep South at this time, you know, make available to the settlers in the region. And so there are some people who come to Texas. Those are usually small time farmers, people who have limited means and are trying to find a way to leverage what little they have. But there are a lot of people and a lot more people, frankly, who don't come. And these tend to be the more well-off people and they're the people who decide that it's not worth the risk to them. Everybody who's going to Texas is making a calculated risk. For some people, that's a worthwhile decision. For others, it's not. And as the settlements continue going forward in the 1820s, that tends to hinge on the attitudes of the governments in Texas, the Mexican government in particular, over the issue of slavery. Let's take stock of our story here for a second. The Spanish approved Moses Austin's plan, and he's going to settle the Texas borderlands with a lot of Anglo-American farmers. And these Anglo-American farmers are going to come because they want to rebuild their fortunes after the Panic of 1819 by participating in the Cotton Revolution, which Texas has the perfect soil for. But somehow, that doesn't seem like enough. So why don't we add a little bit more adventure to our story? The Mexican War for Independence begins just as Austin's getting his plans off the ground. Andrew. 
How did the Mexican War for Independence affect Austin's settlement plans for Texas? Well, it throws everything into uncertainty very quickly. So when Moses Austin comes to Texas, his plan is approved, but it's approved by the Spanish. And then Moses, on his way back, just to make this more complicated, he contracts, we think, pneumonia on his way back to the United States to get all of this started. And he quickly dies after his return to the United States. So his entire enterprise is taken up and continued by his son, Stephen. So it is Stephen F. Austin who rides into Texas in July 1821 to begin this movement of Americans into northern New Spain. And when he's riding to San Antonio, he rides up to the city. And and as he's approaching San Antonio, word gets to him and his companions that the Mexican War for Independence has succeeded. This revolution within Mexico has succeeded. And Mexico is now independent of Spain as soon as Austin arrives. And the question is, what is this going to mean? The Spaniards, now Mexicans, who lived in San Antonio, said, don't worry about it. We'll figure out what it means. You go start your settlement. So Austin began settling Americans, even though it wasn't clear if this new government was going to approve what he was doing. And so within Mexico, Mexico has to build a country out of the rubble of New Spain, and they have to decide what kind of government structure they're going to have. And in 1823, they call a constitutional convention. It's going to write a new constitution for this new Mexican nation. And they have representatives from all over Mexico that go down to Mexico City. And they start debating all these questions about what this country is going to look like, what it's going to be. And for Austin and for his sponsors in San Antonio, the Tejanos, the central question was, are you going to allow us to continue American immigration into Mexico? And as it turned out, and this is always surprising to my students when I teach the Texas History Survey, allowing Americans to come into Mexico was not controversial amongst most Mexicans. Most Mexicans recognized they needed people in Texas and they needed them there to help make sure they control the territory instead of the Comanches. But what was controversial was the fact that these Americans who were coming in were bringing slavery with them. They were trying to bring Mississippi agriculture to Mexico. And in so doing, they're bringing in slave labor with them. And slavery turns out to be the most controversial issue in all of this because slavery was something that almost all Mexicans wanted to outlaw at their moment of independence. Yeah, Mexico was a free country that had abolished slavery, and yet you have all these Anglo-American settlers and Tejanos in that northern Mexican state of Texas who support and want to practice slavery. This had to have caused a lot of tension between Mexico and Texas. So would you tell us about the tensions slavery caused between Mexico and Texas? What's interesting is that when Mexico became independent, it wasn't clear what was going to happen with the slavery issue. The Spanish had always approved slavery. Slavery was legal under the Spanish Empire. It continued to be legal in Cuba, which the Spanish continued to control during this territory. But when Mexico became independent, most Mexicans wanted to outlaw slavery for three basic reasons. The first reason was that they just fought and won a war for liberty and independence, right? And so in this era of the rights of man, there was a sense amongst many revolutionaries who said, we don't want to endorse slavery. That's a terrible thing. So let's not do it. The second reason was that African chattel slavery, the way it was practiced in the United States, was not an important part of the Mexican economy at that time. Mexico had imported huge numbers of enslaved Africans in the 1500s and part of the 1600s, but they had rapidly transitioned away towards Indian labor of various forms, some of which was slavery as well. But African chattel slavery was not an important part of any part of the Mexican economy in any state within Mexico by the 1820s. So getting rid of it would have required very little sacrifice. But the third reason that most Mexicans wanted to outlaw slavery was the most powerful, which is that Mexico, at its moment of independence, needs international friends. And the most powerful and influential country in the 19th century was the British Empire, was Great Britain. And the British also happened to own the vast majority of Mexican debt at this particular moment. And so the Mexican nation needs the approval of the British. And the British also happened to be, at this moment, the leading anti-slave trade country in the Atlantic world. And so the idea of endorsing slavery within Mexico means that they have a risk of alienating the British at the moment they can't afford to do that. And so most Mexicans want to outlaw slavery. The only exception to that are the Mexicans in Texas, the Tejanos, who are sponsoring these Anglo farmers coming in from Mississippi and Alabama. And the Tejanos say, look, listen, everybody, we don't like slavery either, but we need it as a means to an important end. We need it to bring in these Americans who will bring in the cotton economy. That will mean economic development. It will mean security for the region. And what the Tejanos say is if we don't do that, 
what's going to happen is we're going to remain weak in Texas. This portion of the country will collapse and that will expose the rest of the entire Mexican nation to an invasion or who knows what else. It'll bring instability to everything. And so the Tejanos argue left and right and up and down that they have to keep slavery legal in Texas as a means to stabilizing the Mexican nation. And so these debates go on and on as Mexico writes its national constitution. And then in 1824, Mexico finishes its constitution. And the end result is Mexico does not outlaw slavery. (laughs) The Mexican constitution of 1824, in fact, doesn't say anything about slavery. And when it does that, it makes slavery an issue for the individual states to decide for themselves, which is very similar to what the United States did in dealing with the slavery issue at its moment of early nationhood. And so that leads to a long and protracted fight over slavery and its future in Mexico because everybody in Texas is determined to keep the system as a way of increasing farming and therefore American immigration into the territory that will bring stability and wealth to the area. When you look at the timeline of events, it doesn't seem like Texas remained part of Mexico for very long because Mexico secured its independence in 1821. And in 1835, the Texas Revolution began. Andrew, would you tell us about the Texas Revolution and why Texans wanted their independence from Mexico? Yeah. So these things do happen really fast. That's one of the reasons I wrote the book. I was just fascinated by the transitions that happen in this territory. I mean, Texas goes from being a part of the Spanish Empire, really part of the Comanche Empire, to a thriving Anglo-Mexican state, to an independent republic for nine years, to the westernmost outpost of the United States, all within you know just a very short period of time. Texas was only a part of Mexico for about 15 years. And so during the 1820s, as you have these American farmers coming in, they're pouring into the territory. By 1830s, about 10,000 of them. And they're bringing slaves with them. They're getting into fights with the Mexican government about the legality and future of slavery in the region. And then Mexico in 1830 is so alarmed by how many Americans are coming in that Mexico tries to outlaw American immigration into Mexico which I always think is ironic given modern debates about the border and all that sort of stuff. But it's in 1830 that Mexico passes a law that outlaws American immigration into Mexico. They basically try to clamp down on the territory. But what happens at that exact moment is that there's another cotton boom starting in about 1830, 1831, and it goes to about 1835, where cotton prices go through the roof again. And when that happens, the economic incentives to move to Texas to grow cotton increase tremendously. And so Americans continue to pour into Texas now illegally. And so from 1830, when there's 10,000 Anglo farmers, it increases by 1835 to 21,000 Anglo farmers. So the Americans who are coming to Texas more than double in numbers during that five-year period, the exact same moment that Mexico is trying to clamp down on American immigration to the territory. And that leads to a lot of conflicts and fights that ultimately culminate in the Texas Revolution in 1835 and 1836, where Americans are struggling to increasingly control this territory. But this also happens within a context within Mexico, where the Mexican government in Mexico City is trying to control all of the country and is not succeeding in doing so. And so there's a movement in Mexico City to throw out the Constitution of 1824. And that happens with a guy named Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. And when that happens, there's a civil war that breaks out within Mexico. And so it's a really complicated story and it's really convoluted. But the short version is that people in Texas wanted to control the territory. And over this period of time, they become increasingly alienated from Mexico City and Mexico City's efforts to try to rein the region in. And that's what leads to the Texas Revolution. And at the epicenter of that is the issue of slavery, because it was the only piece of real contention between those in Texas and the rest of Mexico about how this area was going to be governed. We should really explore this slavery issue a little bit more, because in The Seeds of Empire, Andrew notes that historians agree that slavery played a role in Texans' decision to seek independence from Mexico, but disagree over how much of a role and what role it played. Andrew, would you tell us how and why historians agree and disagree about the role slavery played in Texans' decision to seek independence from Mexico? Most of the writing about what caused the Texas Revolution happened in the early 20th century. There were a few historians at the University of Texas in the 1920s who were writing about these issues. And mostly they were saying, no, slavery had nothing to do with this. Slavery was not a big deal. It was Texas nationalism and it was fighting for liberty by itself. And slavery is not really a part of that. 
And that was a very powerful story. It was something that was taught in fourth and seventh grade Texas history classes because everybody in Texas who goes to school in K through 12 takes Texas history at fourth and seventh grade. And it became kind of enshrined in the story of Texas and sort of popular mythology that it was this fight for liberty and independence and the struggle against tyranny. And slavery does not fit well (laughs) into that storyline in any way, shape or form. And so there was a lot of very Texas nationalistic kind of historical writing that was done up until World War II that became a very powerful sort of storyline there. And so for a lot of historians to continue to sort of follow that line, not in the Texas nationalism sort of sense, but followed the argument that, you know, the Texas Revolution came from this conflict between Americans and Mexicans who just were too different to stay in the same country for long, that this was basically inevitable. Slavery was there maybe, but the real story is Anglo-Americans and Mexicans were just too different. And that comes from that interpretation that goes all the way back to the early 20th century. On the other side, there's an argument that's been advanced mostly by Mexican historians, I mean Mexican nationalists, that says that slavery was the central conflict in the Texas Revolution. And this comes from this argument that's been put forward by some scholars in Mexico that points to all the conflicts about slavery and say that it's all about slavery. It's only about slavery. The Texas Revolution is only a revolt to preserve this institution of slavery. And part of that is a way of discrediting the Texas Revolution and pushing violently against this sort of Texas nationalism interpretation that's so popular within Texas. I argue they're both wrong. (laughs) What I try to say is that you have to understand that slavery is the thing that is the central conflict between the settlers in Texas and the Mexican government. Absolutely. But you also have to take seriously the fact that this happens within the context of a civil war across Mexico. And so when the people in Texas are arguing that they want to restore the Constitution of 1824, they're being serious. You know, independence is not the first part of the Texas Revolution. It's not even their goal during the first several months of the war. That's something they decide on at the very end, as things in many ways are falling apart in Texas during the revolution. And you can only understand that by looking at the broader context of the political situation within Mexico and really taking it seriously. How did Texans fare once they achieved their independence from Mexico and had the chance to institute their own government and economic systems? So the Republic of Texas was essentially the fallback plan for everybody in Texas. Their first goal was to join the United States because it would give them protection. It would give them a stable government structure. It would help them solve the fact that uh, the Republic of Texas was already $1.25 million in debt when it became independent. But the United States rejected Texas from annexation, mostly over the slavery issue. And so Texans had to create an independent republic. And everybody in Texas knew that it would be a republic built built on cotton. 95% of the exports coming out of Texas at this time were cotton. It was pretty much all it was. It wasn't sugar. It wasn't any other commodity. It was almost exclusively cotton. And so as a result, that meant also that they needed to protect slavery as an institution. And so the Republic is established as a cotton empire, and it is a slaveholder's republic. And they enshrine this idea of protecting slavery within the Republic of Texas within the Constitution of the Republic of Texas, which says in Section 9 of the Constitution that the Republic can never, ever, ever outlaw slavery, challenge slavery, undermine slavery. Basically, the Republic of Texas says slavery will never be challenged or threatened within the Republic of Texas. If you're a slaveholder in the Republic, you can't even free your own slaves unless you throw them out of the Republic of Texas. They do everything they can to build up iron walls around the Republic. The reason they do this is to establish a safe haven, essentially, for cotton farmers and slaveholders in North America. They do it in response to Mexico's efforts to outlaw slavery, and they're saying, well, now we can preserve it the way we want it to be. But they also do it, and they primarily do it, as an advertisement to farmers in the Mississippi River Valley. Because for the Republic of Texas to survive long term, they need migrants from the United States, and they know they need migrants from the United States. So how are they going to convince people to leave Mississippi and come to Texas? The way they're going to do it is tell them, listen, if you come to Texas, your slaveholding is going to be safe here. In a way, they're never going to be safe in the United States because in the United States, you have anti-slavery politicians like John Quincy Adams, or you have abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison who are attacking slavery and screaming about slavery and making Southern slaveholders increasingly uncomfortable and nervous. 
What Texas is saying is saying, look, we're not going to have any of that ever. We are a slaveholding republic. This is a haven. You can come here. And what they're hoping that will accomplish for them is it will open the floodgates to American farmers to come into Texas. That will expand the cotton economy into Texas. And then Texas ultimately, their hope is going to emerge as the leading cotton producer in North America, the leading producer of cotton that goes to the British Empire and make them very wealthy in the process. And how did this plan go for Texas? Were they able to encourage enough settlement? And did they ever pull off their plan to become the premier cotton producer in North America? No, it fails miserably. It absolutely blows up in their faces. And there's two reasons for that. The first reason is that they quickly find themselves internationally isolated because they are a slaveholders republic. As a new nation, they need other countries to recognize them and sign trade agreements with them. And so the United States recognizes Texas in March of 1837, basically as Andrew Jackson is walking out of the White House, he signs a recognition deal. But in the early years, the only success the republic has, the British refuse to sign on to recognizing the republic because the British say, listen, we are the leading anti-slavery nation in the world. We do not want to recognize a slaveholders republic. We're already getting slave produced cotton from Mississippi. We don't need it from you. And if we recognize you, that goes against our efforts to shut down the slave trade. And by this point, the British have passed their 1833 anti-slavery measure that frees so many of their own slaves within the Caribbean. They don't want to touch it. And when the British won't recognize you, almost no other European nation will. And so the Texans find themselves isolated that way, which means they can't get loans, they can't get trade agreements, nobody will buy their cotton, things go really, really poorly. And then, for a double whammy, there's the Panic of 1837 that happens almost exactly at the same moment that Texas becomes independent. And this hits the Republic extremely hard because when the economy starts collapsing, by 1839, cotton prices are tumbling. Much like oil recently you know, went from $130 a barrel down to $30 a barrel, the same general thing happened to cotton in the late 1830s and early 1840s. The price goes to the floor. The Republic of Texas cannot afford that because it's the only thing they have. 95% of their exports are cotton. And so when that goes to the floor, they've got no cotton that anybody will buy, no international agreements, therefore no loans. And they start going into this tailspin into the floor because they're bankrupt. They start printing their own money that's virtually worthless as soon as it comes off the printing presses. They try to tax their own citizens on anything they can imagine, but it doesn't really matter because their citizens have no money with which to pay their taxes. And so the Republic becomes this dysfunctional mess from the very word go. Jason would like to know more about the ethnic relationships within Texas and whether they contributed to some of the dysfunction of the Texas Republic. What did an independent Texas mean for residents of Texas? I mean, would you tell us about relationships between the Anglos, Tejanos, and Native American peoples who lived within the Republic? Following the Battle of San Jacinto in April 1836, that ends the Texas Revolution and essentially begins the Republic of Texas, you have this massive flood of Americans who start coming into the Republic of Texas. You do have a lot of migration that starts moving into Texas during this time period. And that, that really starts changing things in Texas. The first thing it starts changing is that the ethnic Mexicans who lived in Texas, the Tejanos, who had been at the forefront of bringing the Americans into Texas originally, who had sponsored the Austin colonies, who had made it possible for these Americans to come in, they get pushed to the margins very, very quickly. When Texas was a part of Mexico, it was the Tejanos who had been the representatives of Texas in the Mexican legislatures. And so the Tejanos, they were always fewer in number. There was never more than about 3,000 of them in the territory, but they had a very large political influence. And so the Anglos basically depended on the Tejano and Tejano support politically. And so there'd always been this Anglo-Tejano alliance that had made all of that possible. But when Texas becomes an independent republic, that changes almost overnight because you have all these Americans pouring into the territory who are just arrived at Texas and almost none of them care <laughs> what the Tejanos did in the 1820s or any of the period before the Texas Revolution. And when Texas becomes an independent republic, the Tejanos no longer have that really important political position they have. They're no longer the representatives of Texas to any government. They're just a very small portion of the people who live in Texas. And so the Tejanos get pushed to the margins very, very quickly, and their stock falls very, very fast. And the best example of that is a person named Juan Seguin. Juan Seguin's family had been involved in bringing Americans into the territory from the very beginning. In fact, it was his dad, Erasmo Seguin, who had guided 
Stephen F. Austin into Texas on his first trip into the territory. And the Seguin family had been in Mexico City trying to keep slavery from being outlawed because they knew that was important for Anglo immigration. And then during the Texas Revolution, Juan Seguin was at the Alamo. He was on the Texan side of the fight. He's one of the, the people who was a courier. He took a message out of the Alamo, so he didn't die there. But he was at the Battle of San Jacinto that won the Texas Revolution, again, fighting with Sam Houston and the Texans against Santa Ana's armies. And so he was a hero of the Texas Revolution at all different levels. But once Texas became a republic, he and other Tejanos got pushed to the margins very, very quickly. And so of the tens of thousands of Anglos are moving into Texas, most don't care what Seguin and his family did for settlements in the 1820s. And they start turning on the Seguin family very quickly. In 1842, Mexico invades the Republic of Texas twice as a way of harassing the Republic during this period. And Seguin gets accused by a lot of Anglos of helping support the Mexican army. He didn't. He had nothing to do with it. But it didn't really matter. He looked Mexican. And so the Anglos in the area around San Antonio where Seguin lived tried to hunt him down and lynch him. And he had to run to Mexico just to escape being killed with in Texas. And he did. He went to Mexico, where he was promptly jailed as a traitor in Mexico for being a part of the Texas Revolution. But that was, as far as he was concerned, better than being killed within Texas by these Anglos who were taking over the territory. And so there's a really tragic story about what happens to the Tejanos after Texas becomes an independent republic. But it's not much of a better story for the Indians in Texas, because the Anglos who are moving into the territory quickly declare war on the Indians in East Texas as a way of clearing out territory for Texan farmers. And so under one of the Republic of Texas presidents, Mirabu Lamar, there's a Texas army that basically mows down what's left of the Indian presence in East Texas, where they kill Caddo's and Shawnees and Delaware's Indians and declare essentially race war is how Lamar describes it in his letters. And they arrest eradicate a lot of the Indian presence in East Texas. And so there's this massive and very violent movement of Americans moving to the territory that push all the other groups to the margins very quickly. From your description, it seems pretty clear that Texans wanted to be part of the United States. They'd applied for statehood in 1837 and were turned down. And when they were turned down, they did the only thing that they could do, which was to set up a republic. But by 1845, it's pretty clear that that republic isn't working out. So, Andrew, Why did Americans change their mind about admitting Texas to the United States in 1845? Because on the surface, it doesn't seem like they stood much to gain from adding a failing slave republic to the Union. Texans, you know, originally wanted to be a part of the United States because it was in their interest and get rejected. But they come back to the idea in the mid 1840s, essentially because the Republic of Texas is a failed state. When Sam Houston is reelected as president of the Republic of Texas, he looks around and realizes this is not working. We are collapsing into ourselves and it's all falling apart. The problem there is that for Texas to convince Americans to annex Texas, you're going to have to convince most Americans that this is a good idea because the original way that this was going to get settled was a treaty between the Republic of Texas and the United States, which means you need two thirds of the United States Senate to approve that treaty. Well, The majority of Southern politicians wanted Texas because it would bring in more Southern votes to the United States Congress. You're going to get two more senators who are going to vote for slave state interests and all that went with that. But most white Northerners opposed bringing in Texas for all the same reasons. They didn't want to expand the power of Southern slave states to the exclusion of Northern free states. And so there had always been this tension between these two groups. What made the difference, though, is, again, the influence of the British. So the British had watched the Republic of Texas flail and then begin to completely fail. And the British decided in the early 1840s that this represented an opportunity for them. And so if you read the British diplomatic correspondence, which is just fascinating, what they decide is that because Texas is failing, the British could go to the Texans and say, listen, guys, you guys are about to collapse. But we, the British, can help you. We can give you money. We can give you military support. We can make sure your country survives. You just have to get rid of slavery in order to do that. And so the British decide to recognize Texas as a part of trying to get influence in the region. And the long-term British plan is to turn Texas into a free state, a free country that still grows cotton. That will get free labor cotton for the British textile mills, which will be good for them. But it will also help check American expansion across the continent. And they'll put a big roadblock, essentially, to the expansion of the slave south in the United States. The British liked all of those things. 
And so Sam Houston decides to use this as a way of scaring Americans into being more open to the idea of annexing Texas, because white Northerners may not like the idea of adding a slave state. But most white Northerners also hate the British even more than they do the idea of adding another slave state. And if there's one thing all Americans can agree on at this time, it's that they don't like the British. And so Sam Houston and some of his colleagues start sending letters to the United States saying, essentially, listen, guys, we don't really have a choice here. The British are starting to use their influence on us. We're going to have to go with them, maybe get rid of slavery in the process, unless you guys annex us. And so they use this on the John Tyler administration as a way of trying to get them to move again on annexation. And it kind of works. Tyler responds to all of this, takes annexation to the United States Senate in June of 1844. But unfortunately for the Texans, it fails again, again on the slavery issue. And at that point, everybody thought Texas annexation was dead in the water. And almost everybody agreed on that. What changed things and pivoted them finally towards annexation going through was the election of 1844, when Henry Clay came out as the Whig candidate and said, we're going to ignore the Texas question, we're just going to move past that. And he thought that was all that was going to be. And the Democrats, after that, nominate James K. Polk as their nominee. And Polk comes out and says, no, no, we're going to annex Texas and we're going to take Oregon, which was a brilliant political move. Because by taking Texas, you give something to the southern states, but by taking Oregon, you give something to the free states, and you can balance things out, and you get to keep the British out of both of these territories. And so it was enough to get enough support for Polk to eke out a victory as president in 1844, but it also gave enough movement to annexation once again to get a new deal to go to the United States Congress. But this time, they still couldn't get two-thirds of the Senate. They decided to go with a different way and do what was called a joint resolution, where you needed both houses of the Congress, so the House and the Senate, to pass a resolution to annex Texas, which means you need a bare majority in the Senate and a bare majority in the House, which was a lot easier to accomplish than two-thirds of the Senate. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. We've just been discussing what a failure the Republic of Texas was. But in your opinion, what might have happened if the Republic of Texas had been a success? How would an independent Republic of Texas have affected the antebellum and later history of the United States? Well, let's just assume that the cotton markets don't collapse in the late 1830s, 1840s. And so cotton's booming and the British decide to get over themselves and recognize the Republic of Texas, which if those two things had happened and the Republic succeeds, what would have happened? Well, in some ways, maybe what would have happened is what the Texans had hoped would happen, which is Texas would thrive. And as it's thriving and protecting slavery, abolitionism continues to grow in political influence in the United States. If that happens and you have a lot of Southerners in Mississippi or South Carolina, for that matter, who are feeling increasingly threatened, you might have had a significant migration to the Republic as it would have continued to expand. And secession in the Southern United States might have still happened, but it might have happened earlier. You might have had states like Louisiana secede to join the Republic of Texas. If that happened, you'd have this whole little cotton slavery empire, essentially everything the Confederacy later wants to be, but you might have it five. 10 years earlier, it might look a little different. Very unlikely you're going to have Virginia leave or North Carolina for that matter, or Tennessee to join this. But those states that are contiguous to Texas, you know, Arkansas, Louisiana, and then Mississippi and Alabama, if Louisiana goes, they might join that territory. And that presents a much different challenge to whoever was president of the United States in trying to deal with this. Because when secession happens in 1860-61, Abraham Lincoln, when he becomes president in March 1861, he says, look, you guys can't leave. This has all just happened right now. I refuse to acknowledge that you guys are a separate country. But if this happens in a different context and these places join Texas, Texas was never a part of the United States in this scenario. And so if Louisiana is leaving to join this other country, it makes it much more politically difficult, especially if Texas is recognized internationally by countries within Europe for an American president to deal effectively with a secession problem in the southern United States. So in that scenario, and if cotton prices stay high, 
which is the other key here. This territory probably would have at least succeeded and persisted for much longer past the 1840s, or in that case, in the 1860s long term. What aspect of Southern history and Southern expansion into the West are you researching about now, Andrew? Yeah. So what I'm working on right now is a book I'm calling Threaded Land. And the idea is to look at migration from the United States westward to the South, which is part of what I'm interested in. But it's kind of like on the ground. How did people understand you know, where they could go, how things would work? What were the logistics? How did the information networks move? How did people move themselves and their families? How did the economic systems make it possible for people to move through these territories? But it's also about Mexican migration up through Mexico into the United States. And it's about these moments of of exchange and movements back and forth between these two areas, how that happened on the ground floor, how that happened as people are actually moving through these territories and through the eyes of those who are living these experiences. That's where the project is heading. Where should we look for more information about you and how we can contact you if we still have questions about the early history of Texas? Sure. I love hearing from people. (laughs) So if anybody wants to contact me, please do. The easiest way to get a hold of me is to go to my website, which is andrewtorget.com. My last name is like Target with an O, -O T-O-R-G-E-T. So andrewtorget.com and there's contact information on there and people can email me directly and get in touch with me. Andrew Torget, thank you so much for sharing the early history of Texas with us. This is the first time Ben Franklin's world has ventured into Texas. And I have to say, it was a lot of fun. It's a weird and wonderful place, and I really appreciate the time on the show. Thank you. Economic necessity. Moses Austin schemed to bring Anglo-American farmers into Texas in order to profit from the Cotton Revolution and to recover financially from the Panic of 1819. These facts have my brain drawing connections to why other colonies and states were founded. In fact, in many ways, when I stop to think about it, the founding of Texas for reasons of economic necessity fits in well with why most other American colonies and states were founded. I really enjoyed Andrew's explanation of how historians have used slavery in different ways to explain why Texans sought their independence from Mexico. It seems clear that slavery played a role in Texans' decision to seek independence. But was it the only reason? Andrew seems to think that Texans wanted their independence, yes, because of slavery, but also because Mexico was embroiled in a civil war, and the Texans disagreed with other Mexicans over the politics and course of that war. Yet, what I think surprised me most about our conversation is that I've always been under the impression that Texans wanted their independence from Mexico and that they joined the United States only as a last resort. Now, I am not sure where I got this idea from, but from our conversation, it is clear that forming and maintaining an independent Republic of Texas was the option of last resort and that joining the United States had always been plan A. And speaking of plan A, whatever size role you think slavery played in Texans' decision to seek independence from Mexico it clearly played a huge role in the United States' decision to admit Texas into the Union. Look for more information about Andrew, his book Seeds of Empire, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 115. This episode was sponsored by Cornell University Press, which happens to be the first university press in the United States. And as the first, they've had time to figure out what historical topics make for great reading. So why not check out their special Ben Franklin's World Listener sales page? On it, you'll find several fantastic books about early American history offered at a 30% discount, which is cheaper than you can find them on Amazon or in your favorite bookstore. And if you're like me, you'll need a way to try and choose which books you want to purchase, which is why you should check out some of our conversations with Cornell authors. Episode 46 features a conversation with Ken Miller about his book Dangerous Guests, which explores what the Continental Congress did with the British and German POWs during the American War for Independence. And then, of course, there's episode 47, which features a conversation with Emily Conroy Crutz about her book, Christian Imperialism. I've included links to everything on the show notes page, or you can visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Cornell. I realize this episode presented the early American history of Texas in a whirlwind overview. So I'm curious to know what else you'd like to know about this history. What events would you like to see explored in more detail? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.